Sunday class, you may head on out. You believe he is king today, church? Amen, he is. So what a joy it is to be able to sing and to be able to praise him. How hard to believe that this is kind of really our last one since normal Sunday of 2022. Next week, Christmas Day, just have one service at 10 o'clock. Um, just looking back, I, God has done a, a lot this year, and I, I really believe uh, that he has just started also, that the doors are just beginning to open up what ha he has in store for us as a church family. I, I am really excited about uh, 2023, excited what God's going to do with us here at, at Reformation Church. Hey, if you remember this fall, God gave us that uh, threefold vision of really uh, of different things that he has kind of laid in our heart that we've been praying for, things to start to pray for, what the Hope Center, uh, so we've been praying for for three years, and in that process right now, we'll be able to get that building, God, give us someone to lead that, and we're just excited about how that's going to happen in 2023, and what God's going to do, allowing us to be able to impact our city in greater ways, and impact uh, the gospel for Jesus Christ. Uh, we also said, talk about planting in New Kensington, and we're grateful for Brent and Emily Phillips, and they're going to be moving up there this summer, and just started a community group to celebrate recovery, and we're excited what God's going to do as that kind of gets on its way in 2023. And, and then also just the expanding this building. Uh, it's not about getting bigger, it's about being faithful, it's making disciples that God has given us here. We believe that God wants us to continue uh, to make disciples and to get a, a little bit uh, bigger just here. And, and we just want to be faithful to what he has done. As you kind of look around, it, it gets a little bit full sometimes. And uh, we're grateful for that. Um, if you came in today and you're like, my knees seem like they're touching a little bit closer. That's because we added one more row. Uh, so they might be a little bit closer. There's only a few top. Now, for me, it doesn't affect me at all. I still have plenty of room. But some of you tall, you might know that. Uh, but we put in every blue chair that we have in this church. Okay, So this is maxed out. We have as many as 270 seats. That's it. Um, and, and so we're grateful for what God is doing in, in this service. The second service has a little bit more space. So if you're like, I really need a little bit. Well, there's a little bit more space in the second. If you want to move uh, to the second. But we're grateful for what God is doing. And uh, we believe that God is leading us to continue to uh, build a, a worship center. And hopefully that will at least break ground in 2023. And uh, but again, that's up the hill. We are walking in how he wants us to. And trying to be faithful to what he has called us to. Don't you believe that God is up to something? Yes. Believe he is. And I hope that we will continue to seek him. Continue to glorify him, continue to stay humble, and, and I believe that God will continue to do as only he can do. And we'll have a front row seat uh, of watching him move. But we're in an Advent series this uh, winter, and um, the title Peace Has Come, and, and I believe this world and every individual is looking for peace. We talked about peace in the Old Testament as it being fullness, a whole, or completion. And, and two weeks ago, I talked about peace with God and, and the importance that now that we have been justified, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That true wholeness and true completion is only going to come through Jesus Christ. We are broken people, and he's the only one that can make us whole. And last week, Pastor Justin masterfully did a great job talking about peace with our past. And he talks about guilt and shame and regret and that we don't have to have those anymore because of Jesus Christ. And if you missed those last two weeks, I hope that you get on the YouTube channel and you're watching. So you can get caught up as we are looking at, at peace together. Now, the subject I want to talk about today, I believe, is really important when it comes to this whole area uh, of peace. Uh, one that we need to talk about, one that's not always the most fun. But that is to have peace with others. But listen, raise your hand if you have ever had a conflict with somebody before. Yeah, I just want to make sure we need this message. I mean, there's a couple of you that have it. That's great. Uh, you can pray for the rest of us. Uh, but I, I think for most of us, we have had some conflict with somebody. I, I read this week, Warren Barker, who was the 15th Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, in 1982, he said this. One reason our courts have become overburdened is that Americans are increasingly turning to the courts for relief from a range of personal distresses and anxieties. Remedies for personal wrongs that once were considered the responsibility of institutions other than the courts are now boldly asserted as legal entitlements. Now look at this last line that he said. The courts have been expected to fill the void created by 
the decline of church, family, and neighborhood unity. I'll tell you, that's a powerful statement right there. But what he is saying is the church and the family don't know how to make peace, don't know how to have unity, and so we've had to run to the court system in order to try to find some type of amends. The courts are having to take care of issues that we should be able to handle. You see, we don't know how to make really peace with others. Listen, we're not talking about today how to make world peace. I'm sure many of you have thoughts on that, right? Oh, we can do this, we should do this, we should do this. But we really don't have any power to do that today. But what we want to talk about today, listen, you do have the power to do it. And that is to have peace with those around you. Open your Bibles up to James, James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we're going to walk through this text together. And before we get there, as you're turning there, I, I want to just kind of bring up a couple other verses to help us understand that this theme of peace is not just in this one text here, but it's all through the scriptures. And, and we don't have time to go all through the Old Testament, so I'm just going to kind of look at some of the New Testament verses as we kind of see this theme of peace, as I just kind of Google peace in, a, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, Old Testament, and just look at all the different places, it is all over the scripture. Jesus starts, let's look at this one, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, when he's given the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I mean, one of the Beatitudes that we see is he's giving this, uh, this talk to his disciples. He's saying, listen, blessed are you if you are a peacemaker. For you will be called the sons of God. Listen, how many want to be called sons and daughters of God? I do. Blessed are the peacemakers. We get to John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, Jesus is, is kind of giving his high priestly prayer. Or right before he's about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and not take him to the cross. And as he's there praying for the disciples and praying there, he prays that they would be unified. He prays that they would be whole, that they'd be at peace. He says, the glory that you have given to me, I give to them, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is saying, God, listen, how we are one, I want them to be one. I am them and you and me, that they may be perfectly one in all the things that Jesus could have prayed about in the high priestly prayer. All the things that he could have mentioned at the end, right before he goes to the cross, one thing that he makes sure that he prays is, God, as we are one, help them to be one also. Pray for peace, pray for unity. We go into Paul's writings, Romans chapter 14, Paul says, so then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual uplifting. Paul says, let's pursue this. Let's pursue what makes for peace. And he goes to the church of Ephesus. And in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. So here he's telling the church of Rome, he's telling the church in Ephesus, and then the church of Thessalonica, he says the same thing. He says, be at peace among yourselves. The book of Hebrews could have been read by Paul, we don't know exactly, but the book of Hebrews, he says this, strive, or she says this, strive for peace with everyone. Strive for peace with everyone. Hey, here's the point we're trying to get caught, even before we got, get to James, because James is going to say the same thing. Listen, we have peace with God. We're supposed to have peace with our past. We can have peace with our past because of Jesus Christ, and God wants us to have peace with others. He asks us to, he calls us to, he tells us to pursue it. Listen, it's going to take work. I mean, you can see it in these verses. I mean, pursue what makes for peace. Eager to maintain, be at peace among yourself, strive for peace. This isn't something that's just going to even sit, it's going to actually just happen. And I said, listen, you have to go after this. This is something that you have to pursue. Because if you just kind of say, we'll see what happens, I guarantee it's not going to happen. You have to pursue it. Let's read now, James, what he says. James chapter 3, the verses today are 13 through 18. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? 
by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. For if you are bitter, and for if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there would be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is God's word for us to obey today. James it is a book of wisdom, right? It's a book of wisdom. But for James, wisdom is not some higher knowledge. No, no, wisdom is acting upon what you know. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word in chapter 1. He also says in chapter 1 that religion that is pure and defiled is a religion that goes out and visits the orphans and is unstained from this world. He also says in chapter 2, he says, faith apart from works is dead. You see, James is trying to get across. He's putting our faith on trial and saying, listen, if you truly have this faith, it's going to look like this. James is not about a religion that just looks good on the outside. Just about a religion that has a head knowledge. No, he says, listen, what are you going to do about it? Now, we know works does not save us. But James is telling people, say, listen, look at your life and, and make sure it matches up to holiness. Make sure it matches up to what Jesus Christ, how he lived. In chapter 3, he talks about the tongue, the power that is in that little member of your body. And then it turns here about true wisdom. And he says true wisdom is going to lead to being a peacemaker. There must have been some friction that was going on in chapter 4. You can see it again. There's not really chapter breaks as James wrote this. But look at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. It says, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? And he says, you quarrel, you fight. So there must have been some conflict that was going on, and so James is trying to tell them, listen, we need to be at peace. He says, back in 13, look at us, just kind of walk through this text a little bit. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? So he's asking this question. Now, I don't think he's asking it because he's wanting them to raise their hand and be like, oh, I am. No, he's about to tell them. One of those questions that you ask, but you want me to say it because you're going to tell the answer. And James says, listen, who is wise? Let me tell you. It's it's what they do. He says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He says, their conduct is going to show if they truly are wise. But if not, look at verse 14, they have bitter jealousy or selfish ambition. The word bitter there, it means to cut or to prick. It's a negative word. And then jealousy is envy or contentious rivalry. You who have bitter jealousy or self ambition. Self ambition is just putting someone else, uh, putting yourself before everyone else. It's looking after your good. But the word selfish ambition was used not very much. And, and, but in the Old Testament, or I'm sorry, before even in the New Testament was written, Aristotle, but when he would use this word, he used it to describe greedy politicians who cause division. James is basically calling them out and saying, listen, you're causing division because you're focused on yourself and not anybody else. And then look at verse 15. He says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Now, now look at these next three things. But it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Listen, that's pretty severe. That's a pretty severe behavior. That's almost scary. And he's saying, if you, if you, as you, as you, your bitter jealousy and your selfish ambition, look at that progression. Earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Listen, please note this, that not making peace can lead to demonic activity. Listen, that's not me. Look what he continues to say. He says, but where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile or evil practice. 
But so when you think about yourself and, and look at others, and you can take it to the bank that jealousy and, and envy and, and this vile, evil practices. of what John or James is saying here. That not pursuing peace will destroy you. Listen, you, you have to see that. There will be disorder in every vile practice when you pursue jealousy and selfish ambition. I, and that just, and I read that and looked at that over and over this week. It just continued to hit me. I was like, you know, we take it sometimes lightly that we are our selfish ambition, that we kind of do what we want, or we kind of put our rights above everybody else's. But James is saying, listen, you better be careful because it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it can lead to demonic activity. I think we have to feel that way just a little bit. You, you get in this church, you with me? It, it's important. This is extreme in language that John or James is talking about. So don't take peacemaking lightly. I found that many times we don't really want peace with others, right? But when it really boils down to it, let's just take an illustration of marriage for a second. That many couples that struggle, they don't really want that they'd rather be selfish, they'd rather be on their own course, they'd rather want their way. Now, I don't know if they would actually say, oh, I don't want peace, but their actions are showing that. And again, James doesn't really care as much as what we say, he doesn't do it as much. You see, marriage or uh, other places, we try to avoid peace so often. I, I was thinking this week, just uh, how do we avoid peace? How do we kind of push that aside and just try to avoid peace? I'll give you a couple of ones. One, we just remove ourselves from the situation. And if I don't like to be around that person, then I just won't be around them because then I won't be confronted to make peace with them. And so I'm just going to separate myself from them. Listen, I'm not saying there aren't times that you don't pull away so that you can refocus and, and hear from God. But you should be able to answer this question. Am I pulling away because I am selfish and don't want to deal with this? Or am I pulling away because I really want God to deal with my heart so that I can be a peacemaker? You see, a lot of times the reason why we pull away from people that we don't want to be around is because we don't want to take the effort to be a peacemaker. And so it's easier for us just to kind of avoid it, right? Because if we just avoid it, we turn our back, it's like, well, I don't need to worry about it. I, I, I'm good. But it's when we come face to face with we realize we're going to make the effort or we're going to be peacemakers. So a lot of times we just avoid it. We stay away from it. So we remove ourselves. Another place or another way that we avoid peace is by being our phones. Did somebody even touch that thing before? <laughs> so I, I found that a lot of times, and I, I realize that people don't want to really have that conversation or peace with people, and all they do is just kind of look down at their phone, right? Just kind of remove ourselves physically. So you know, I, you know, maybe not physically remove ourselves, but we emotionally and mentally remove it ourselves. And we just kind of, oh, I'm in the same room. I'm still there. Really? We avoid it. How often does our phone become our out so we don't have to deal with that? Phones have become a haven that we kind of run to. And it, it can be video games, TV, computer, any of that stuff. But we kind of run to to avoid having to really deal with the situation in front of us. And here's another way we avoid peace is, is we just blame others. Right? It's not my fault. They need to be the first one to move. You know, I'm going to stay over here. They're the one that did it. And so when they come, then then all of them take it stuff. But they're the one. They did 95% of the issue. They're the one that hurt me. They're the one that wronged me. So I'm just going to stay back here. I'm going to wait for them. Listen, I'm, I'm glad that the gospel did not start with me making the first move. Right? Maybe I have to agree with you on that. If it would have been me, if Jesus would have stood back here and said, Jeremiah, when you make the first move, then I'll give you grace. I'll, then I'll give you hope and mercy. And, and listen, it never would have happened. Never. The gospel started with Jesus Christ. Even when I'm worthy to sit back, he loved me. So here's the first point I want to give you. Truth number one. It, it's 
My selfish heart must change for peace to come. My selfish heart must change for peace to come. You say, Jeremiah, they sinned against me. They were wrong. But we love to claim our rights. It's not one of the hardest things for me in ministry over the last few years and pursuing people who have hurt me in this. I, I have a folder in my email that um, is titled, Not Fun to Now, by God's grace, it's really not that big, so I'm very grateful for that. Some reason I clicked on it this week and, and, and looked through it, and by God's grace, reminding myself that even on some of those not fun emails, my desire is always to respond back with humility and grace. I'm not saying it's how I feel all the time. But sometimes God has to deal with Jeremiah's heart before I can push send. But to make sure that it is done to peace. And so here's my question to you. Is your selfish heart keeping peace away tonight? Maybe God wants you to take the first step. Deal with your heart first. Repent of your selfish ambition. Listen, please hear me. Do you see in the text what happens when we hold on to selfish ambition? Do you see it? Unearthly, our earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And when we hold on to this, there's disorder in every vile practice. Listen, I don't want you to walk down that road. So repent and ask God to change your heart. Listen, take this seriously, that yes, my heart, my selfishness, even of claiming the right because they might have hurt me, they did something, I'm going to claim my right, that I deserve this. Now let's deal with our selfish heart. Stand like God. Let us take that first step. Peace. And here's the second truth that we need to see in this text, is that peacemaking is wisdom from above. Peacemaking is wisdom from above. Right, look at verse 17. And the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. Now, now, now just look through this list right here. And, and what would happen if you acted out this list with your spouse, with your friends, with your co-worker, with your relatives? It, it, it's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. Look at this next one. Open to reason. I'll tell you, a lot of times when you get people that are in selfish ambition or people that just kind of want their way, they won't listen to anything. Right? Because they know what's right. This is what needs to happen. They got it. They have exactly what should happen. And I love to hear, open to reason. And I found that some talking to some people, one of the first things that they go is any kind of reason. This wisdom here is open to me. Full of mercy. Full of mercy. Listen, mercy is withholding something that someone, they deserve this punishment, but it's holding from them. That's what God did to us, right? Mercy was that God, we deserve wrath, we deserve judgment, and his mercy is he withheld it. Okay, grace is that he gave us the incredible gift of salvation. Mercy is that he withholds what we deserve. Listen, someone who is wise holds back what maybe someone else deserves because they did it. Full of mercy. You say, Jeremiah, you don't know what they did. This, I, I did, they deserve this punishment. They deserve this. Wisdom from above. And it is full of mercy. Full of mercy. And then look, it says, good fruits, impartial, Let me ask you, yes or no, is that list hard to do? Yeah, it is. Listen, being a peacemaker is not for the weak. It's not weakness at all. It's hard. Those who make peace, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Remember what Ephesians says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit 
Hebrews strive for peace with everyone. And here's the third truth that I want you to see. Is eagerly seek and pursue peace in every area of your life. Listen, let us be peacemakers. Eagerly seek it. Pursue it after it. If you want to be a person of peace, you're going to have to pursue it. We have to self put our selfish desires aside, and we're going to have to go after those. We're going to have to pursue it. Now, uh, let's get practical for a moment, and uh, let's uh, apply this text. Uh, maybe as I'm talking through this, that the Holy Spirit keeps bringing someone to your mind over and over again. And you're trying to make every excuse for why you didn't think about that person right now. But let's just start with just work or community. Maybe there's a conflict that happened at work and someone did something to you. Maybe it's just someone you don't like. You don't have to do that. Now, have you tried to be a peacemaker at work? Now, how about church? You said you're mine. I mean, you've always been along at church, right? I wish. <laughs> but why do you think Paul talks about unity so much? Why do you think he's always telling the churches, be unified, seek after unity? Because he knows when people get together that there's going to be friction that's going to come. You see, in today's culture, when friction, you know, conflict comes to the church, people just leave, or they start another church, and, and that's where church splits happen. So what does that say to our world? But when God's people, when believers can't even show love to each other and can't work it out, what does that show? Listen, if there's someone that is in our church body that there's just friction, listen, you need to stay peace. Go after that. Pursue it. Now, let's talk the hardest ways. How about our home and family? Listen, how about your relatives? Let's start there first. Christmas season, for many, is painful because you're around people that you just do not like. And you have to see them at Christmas. And you're going to have that deal with them, and you're just hoping you're not sitting at the same end of the table as they're at. And you're just, I mean, I can bear this for these two hours, and then I'm gone, I'm out. Maybe it's time for you to be a peace pursuer. It's time for you to step out instead of just building a wall uh, pursuing peace. Let me talk to the teenagers that are in here today. Let me ask you, do you seek peace with your parents? Does your life bring peace at your home? Because it's how you respond to what's coming back. Does your life bring peace? Let's take the hardest one to last. How about any Today, are you seeking peace? <clears throat> I, I don't know if there is probably another place that we sh that our selfish ambition shows up more it is in our marriages. Maybe it's probably the place that we hold on to our right, maybe more than any other place, where, where that selfish ambition comes out. You say, Jeremiah, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how hard my marriage is. Listen, that's true. But I've been in this for 20 years, and I've probably heard a story that can top your story. <clears throat> Are you a peacemaker in your own marriage? Are you a peacemaker in your marriage? Jeremiah, am I just supposed to do nothing as he or she is? They, they're abusing me. No, listen, I, if you're being abused, you need to get help. And I'm not saying that. But I've found that we, in our society, have also labeled uh, a lot of situations of abuse as too quick. And what we really are trying to do is just find an excuse to get out. I, I'm not saying that's for everyone. I, I just, it, I've done marriage counseling a lot. <laughs> and, and I found a lot of times just we hold on to our right. We hold on to it. We think that everything should be good. Listen, hear the text. Selfish ambition can turn into evil and demonic practices. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Listen, if you're waiting for your husband or wife to be perfect, you've got a long way to go. They never will. Listen, it was at the altar that she said, Better or for worse. I, I did a marriage yesterday and uh, married a couple. And, and, and yes, uh, the beauty of this, 
she walked down on the knees crying, and then you know they get married, and I say, okay, repeat after me, and, and you know they said for better or for worse. You know what? What I told them though, when I gave them the challenge, I said, really, it's not you holding hands right now and smiling that is really the incredible victory. Because if you still do it. try to pursue peace and they won't. At work, you're trying to do it here. But with this relative, you're trying to pursue peace and they want nothing. Paul is saying here, and I appreciate Paul laying this out. He said, listen, as much as it depends upon you, if it depends upon you in any way, be at peace with all. I, I know some of you right now are trying to give justification in your mind of why you should not pursue peace with that person. Listen, Peace does not mean that you have to be their best friend. Peace does not mean that you can't have boundaries put up because of that person's brokenness also. But if it's the bitterness and selfish ambition in your heart that is leading you to break peace, then you are wrong. Do you hear me? If it's your bitterness and your selfish ambition that is pulling those boundaries back or is leading you to break peace, then listen, you're wrong because Paul says here, listen, pursue peace, do it, as much as it depends upon you. Be God in peace. I read a book this last year. It was titled The Peacemaker. And um, in this book, he gave these four G's for peacemaking. And they're in your bulletin. And I, I would ask you, I have to, to write these down and think through these. And even, um, I'll give you the questions on the screen that he even answers. So if you want to take a snapshot of that at the end. But hey, this is the four G's he says when it comes to peacemaking. First of all, it's glorify God. And, and here's the question that he asks. How can I please and honor God in this situation? Listen, what, what if we ask that question first? Instead of, do I have a right to be around this person? Do I have to be around this person? Well, what if the first question when conflict came or difficult situations came, what if the first question we asked was, how can I please and honor God in this situation? I'll tell you, that's hard. <laughs> I'm not saying that's easy. But what if that is the first question we're asking? Is God in this conflict, in this hurt? God, how do I please you? How do I honor you? How do I glorify you? glorify God. Here's the second thing he says is get the law out of your own eye. How can I show Jesus' work in me by taking responsibility for my contribution to this conflict? You see, this goes back to our first point we talked about. It's my selfish heart must change. Let's get the law out of our own eye. How can I show maybe I'm 1% wrong Okay, great. Then why don't you show Jesus working in your life? Listen, there is an incredible picture of Christ when we show Christ working in us and us taking the first step towards someone to bring peace, to have that restitution. When we take that first step and we get the log out of our own eye, and then secondly, is we gently restore. The question we ask is how can I lovingly serve others by helping them take responsibility for their contribution to this conflict? Listen, instead of pointing the, uh, pointing the finger at them to change, why don't you love them into change? Why don't you love them? And then, number four, go and 
be reconciled. Go and be reconciled. How can I demonstrate the forgiveness of God and urge reasonable solution to this conflict? Listen, I'm not saying that every situation is going to work. Because, yes, there are some that he said don't work. But are you going to be so sure? He says in the book, this quote, he says, when you are involved in a conflict, you too must decide whether or not you will trust God. Trusting God does not mean believing that he will do all that you want, but rather believing that he will do everything he knows is
first step is just thank you. First step is just maybe acknowledge that, yes, there is somebody that I need to pursue peace for. I don't know how it's going to look. It's just your mind's kind of messy. And like, that's fine. You can get some counsel. Talk to somebody. I don't know. Just love what's just so funny. But we just do the first step. That changed my heart. I want to walk down this road of self-destruction. Exalt you that you are a good and 